by divine right. Recently, a good friend of mine told me that he had seen Yasser Arafat, the head of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, known as the PLO, meet with the current pope, John Paul II. And as Yasser Arafat, this terrorist, Arab terrorist individual who has a horrible reputation around the world, that Yasser Arafat knelt down and kissed the Pope's ring. And this very much surprised my friend because he said, wait a minute, I thought Yasser Arafat was one of the enemies. But in actuality, Yasser Arafat understands that he rules by divine right. And every other leader, almost, I would say almost every other leader in our world today rules by divine right. Now as this broadcast continues, you're going to understand exactly what that means. Benjamin Disraeli, a British statesman in the 19th century under the reign of Queen Victoria, once stated this, the world is governed by different personages than those who are not behind the scenes would think. So Benjamin Disraeli made it very, very clear this was back in the 19th century, that the people that we see out there running and calling the shots in our world are not the ones that are really running the scene. They're not the ones who are really in charge of what's going on in the earth. They're simply front people, or as it were, choir boys. Before we continue any further in this tape, let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to understand lessons from history that help us to understand today. Please guide us with thy spirit. Illuminate our minds and our hearts to do thy will and to live for Thee, in Jesus' name, Amen. In Bron Brownson's Review of 1851, this is a Roman Catholic periodical. In that periodical, it stated this, The power of the church exercised over sovereigns is held by divine right, and whoso resists it rebels against the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So according to this Catholic, Roman Catholic periodical of 1851, the Catholic Church controls all leaders by divine right. Now, what, do, what does the Roman Catholic Church mean when it says they control rulers by divine right? It means this. God entrusted this world, according to the papacy, into the hands of the Pope. And now the Pope, via his cardinals, he is the one that is to be in charge of the electing of all rulers. And if a ruler is not obedient to the Roman Catholic Church, then in the eyes of Rome, that ruler has rebelled against the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So the concept of divine right simply declares that it is the Catholic Church's right 
to put kings in place and to drive them from office by a vote, by a sword, by a knife, by a poison cup, or by a leaden bullet. That is divine right. Now probably the greatest illustration of divine right by divine right is mentioned in the book Great Controversy, page 57. We read there on page 57 that Pope Gregory VII back in the late 1100s and into the early 1200s, Pope Gregory VII proclaimed the perfection of the Roman Church. Among the propositions which he put forth was one declaring that the Church had never erred, nor would it ever err according to the Scriptures. The proud pontiff also claimed the power to depose emperors and declared that no sentence which he pronounced could be reversed by anyone, but that it was his prerogative to reverse the decisions of all others. So in the 11th century, in the 10 hundreds, Pope Gregory VII declared that the Catholic Church, the Pope, had the power to depose emperors. If he didn't like an emperor, he could get rid of him simply because of divine right. Now we find very, very interestingly enough that in the year 1065, King Henry IV of Germany got entangled in a controversy with Pope Gregory VII. Now the Pope stated that only he could select bishops, priests, and abbots. However, Henry IV of Germany became very bold and he selected some in the year 1075. Promptly, Gregory VII excommunicated Henry IV and released, by excommunicating him, he released all his subjects from obeying him. So what the Pope simply did, what Gregory VII did was, he said, because this king has stepped out of his bounds and taken prerogatives that are only mine as Pope, Gregory released all of Henry IV's Catholic subjects from obeying the king. So those subjects could kill the king. They could tell him, I'm not going to follow what you say. And there would have been utter anarchy and ruin in Germany. Henry IV's nobles threatened him that they would not ex recognize him unless he received forgiveness from the Pope. So what happened? Great controversy, pages 57 and 58, it tells us what happened. For presuming to disregard the Pope's authority, this monarch was declared to be excommunicated and dethroned. Terrified by the desertion and threats of his own princes, who were encouraged in rebellion against him by the papal mandate, Henry felt the necessity of making his peace with Rome. In company with his wife and a faithful servant, he crossed the Alps in midwinter, that he might humble himself before the Pope. Upon reaching the castle whither Gregory had withdrawn, he was conducted without his guards into an outer court. And there, in the severe cold of winter with uncovered head and naked feet and in a miserable dress, 
he awaited the Pope's permission to come into his presence. Not until he had continued three days fasting and making confession did the pontiff condescend to grant him pardon. Even then, it was only upon condition that the emperor should await the sanction of the pope before resuming the insignia or exercising the power of royalty. Gregory, elated with his triumph, boasted that it was his duty to pull down the pride of kings. Now the castle where Henry IV and Gregory VII met was a castle called Canossa. And the name Canossa has become synonymous with the submission of the secular power or of kings and presidents and rulers to the ecclesiastical power of Rome. And any time a leader is in abject submission to the Pope, a catchword that is used is simply kenosa, which once again symbolizes submission of a ruler to the Pope. Now, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3 says, and I saw one of her heads as if it were wounded to death, and her deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. In order for all the world to wonder after the beast, it would have to take place that every government, every leader had gone to Canosa, and that now all the leaders in the world are in subjection to the Vatican. Now there was another time in which a man dared to question or to usurp authority that was not given to him by divine right. And it was this experience, this other case that we're going to talk about now, that led to the writing of probably the greatest political document during the Dark Ages. I'm thinking, of course, of the one that was signed at Runamede in England, in 1215 A.D. that was entitled the Magna Carta. What led up to the Magna Carta? That's what we're going to take a look at right now. Lest we fail to understand the significance and importance of the Magna Carta, the World Book Encyclopedia tells us that the Magna Carta led to constitutional government in England it placed the king and everyone else under law. And the Magna Carta became part of the framework that led to the Constitution of the United States of America. So the Magna Carta was an extremely important event. The signing of the Magna Carta was extremely important in the light of history, both of England of Protestantism and of America. But what led to the Magna Carta? In 1205, Hubert, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury, the primate of England, he died. King John of England appointed a new primate or a new Archbishop. The English Catholic Church appointed a new cardinal, a new archbishop as well. In the ensuing battle that took place between the Catholic Church in England and King John, King John recognized that the situation would not be resolved 
unless there was an appeal made to Pope Innocent III. Now, Pope Innocent III was one of the most powerful and arrogant and despotic popes of the Dark Ages. So Pope Innocent III makes the appointment of a new Archbishop of Canterbury. But King John becomes very angry at this because Pope Innocent did not consult or confer with King John. He simply appointed it because Innocent III believed that he had the divine right to do so. This angered King John very much because he realized that by appointing the highest church official in England, Pope Innocent III now was wielding power in England greater than even the king himself. And King John recognized very clearly that with this kind of power in England, Innocent III could even appoint a new king. With John in a great tizzy at, at this time, Pope Innocent III hits England with an interdict and then excommunicates King John. Now these two events struck absolute terror into the heart of this English king, King John. When a country was placed under interdict, that meant that there could be no weddings, no funerals, no baptisms, no communion. The church doors would be closed, and this struck terror into the hearts of the people of England. Then when Pope Innocent III excommunicated John, this meant that now all English Catholics no longer had to submit to their king. They could rebel, they could take him from his throne and depose of him. Then when Innocent III saw that at first King John was defiant, Innocent III contacted the French representatives in Rome and he said, I want you to go work out a deal with the French government and I want you to invade England and destroy her. Now I wonder if we see in this event any parallels in modern history. We see one, of course, in the Balkan Wars of the 19, late 1990s, 1997, 1998, because the Orthodox Serbs refused to submit to the authority of the Pope. And so, Pope John Paul II and the Black Pope, the Jesuit general, used their emissaries to NATO and America and Bill Clinton and said, bomb the daylights out of them. Bomb them into submission. And that is exactly what happened. And now in 2001, you have an extremist Islamic faction called the Taliban over in Afghanistan. They're not in submission to the Pope. They're in rebellion against him. And so the Jesuit general plans and executes a bombing on the World Trade Center via airplanes so that he could draw America into a destruction of the Taliban of Afghanistan. And while all that's going on overseas and while all of our eyes are on the terrorist terrorists of the Middle East, the current president, George Bush, is passing one piece of anti-constitutional legislation after another, the 2001 Patriot Act, the pushing for secret international tribunal. Sounds like we're going back to the Dark Ages and the Inquisition. 
through these proposals, through these new laws of George Bush, I saw a recent cartoon in USA Today where two children were decorating a Christmas tree, and one of them sang, He sees you when you're sleeping, He knows when you're awake, He knows if you've been bad or good, So be good for goodness sake. Now in that song that is sung at this time of year, it's always referring to the man from the North Pole, which obviously is totally fictitious. But the other child misunderstands who it's directed to, or he acts as if he misunderstands. And as the child sings this song about seeing you when you're sleeping, knowing when you're awake, knowing if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake, the other child turns to his companion and says, in essence, don't talk about Attorney General Ashcroft that way. In this little cartoon, it has portrayed very, very clearly, in a very humorous manner, the destruction of liberty, of privacy in the United States. So Innocent III strikes England with interdict and then excommunicates John, then sends France to demolish England. By this time, King John has had enough. And King John goes to his own Canossa and submits to the power of the Pope. He gives all of England and his throne to the Pope. He pays 1,000 marks a year as taxes to the Pope. So King John has his own Canossa. We read in the book entitled Elizabeth the Last, written by Bruce McMillan and Evan Sadler on page 17 of this excellent book. They declare, The transaction finished between John and Pandolf, the papal legate, by the king doing homage to the priest with all the submissive rights which feudal law required of subjects before their superior. On this same page, page 17 of this book, Elizabeth the Last, it shows a picture of King John taking off his crown before the Pope's representative. He lays it on the ground. And the papal representative, in order to show the mightiness of his master, kicks John's crown about like a worthless toy. Then he picks it up and places it on the head of the monarch. Never was there a moment of more profound humiliation than this in all the annals of England. But there were other people in England who were not about to lay their country and their lives in submission to a foreign ruler. The English barons decided they would not be the slaves of the Pope, and they determined to wipe off the disgrace which King John had inflicted upon the country. Taking out their swords, they vowed that they would maintain English liberties. They went before King John in June of 1215 at a place called Runnymede, and they demanded that King John sign the Magna Carta. King John resisted, but the barons were undaunted by threats 
that he had no power to maintain. He had become a sickening vomit to the whole nation of England. And so King John at Runemede in June of 1215 signed the Magna Carta. By so doing, he told the Pope that he had revoked his vow of servitude and that he had taken back his kingdom. The Pope instantly launched an anathema against those impious and rebellious barons of England. Why? Because Pope Innocent III perceived the true nature of the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta was a great political protest against the Pope and against popery. It inaugurated an order of political ideas and rights entirely antagonistic to the principles and claims of the papacy. Magna Carta was for constitutional liberty, standing up before the face of papal tyranny and absolution. You see, the Magna Carta denied the Pope the power of divine right. The Magna Carta declared that no pope had any right to govern another country, to put into office any leader. The English barons, in having King John sign the Magna Carta, challenged and threw away the idea of the divine right of kings. But we understand that the Catholic Church never changes. And so when they declare that leaders are put into office by their authority and rule in submission to that authority, we begin to see as history moves on that other leaders will rise and reject the authority of divine right. The United States government in the Declaration of Independence with the, which the papacy declared to be a satanic document, it declared that the United States would be a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. That very statement shot holes in papal tyranny as manifest in the idea of divine right. At this point in our tape, let's turn it over to side two of Behind the Door, part nine, Divine Right. I'd like to welcome you to side two of this tape entitled Behind the Door, Part 9, or Divine Right. As we notice from side one, we ended with the Magna Carta, King John at Runamede in 1215. And the signing of the Magna Carta, again, was a direct attack upon the divine right of the papacy to set up kings and dispose of them at their will. Probably the greatest illustration of somebody who refused to accept the idea of divine right and who, for not giving in to that, had one assassination attempt after another upon her life for a period of 30 years. And finally, when every assassination attempt took place, the most powerful navy the world had ever seen was used to try to destroy her and Protestantism in her country. The person's name is Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth was the second child of Henry VIII, the only child of Anne Boleyn, Henry's second wife. 
Elizabeth came to the throne in 1558 after the death of Bloody Mary, who had reigned for five years. From the book entitled The Babington Plot by J. E. C. Shepard, we read on page 46 of this book, After her ascension, Elizabeth had written to Sir Richard Crane, the English ambassador in Rome, to notify the people of her ascension. But she was informed by His Holiness that England was a fief of the Holy See that Elizabeth had no right to assume the crown without his permission, that she was not born in lawful wedlock and could not therefore reign over England, that her safest course was to renounce all claims to the throne and submit herself entirely to his will. Then he would treat her as tenderly as possible. But if she refused his advice, he would not spare her. She declined the Pope's advice, and the hatred of Pius and his successors was assured. You see, the Catholic Church, as they wrote to Queen Elizabeth I, they said, Elizabeth, you have no right to assume the crown of England without the Pope's permission. That is called divine right. We read on page 47 of this same book, The Babington Plot. It was Pope Sixtus X who promised Philip of Spain a million scudi to assist in equipping his invincible armada to destroy the throne of Elizabeth. And the only condition the Pope made in the bestowment of his gift? That he should have the nomination of the English sovereign and that the kingdom should become a fief of the church. Fief, of course, means slave. On page 50 of this book, we hear of Queen Elizabeth's protector, Sir Francis Walsingham, who made the comment that Pope Pius V had excommunicated Queen Elizabeth from their allegiance. But it did more. It made her assassination a godly act, a deed which conferred money in this world and paradise in the next. You see, we, we just do not comprehend as Americans, and we will pay for our lack of comprehension, but we just do not understand or comprehend the evil and the wickedness and the murderous plots of the Catholic Church to destroy leaders and any other Protestant peoples who deny the authority of the Pope. So killing Queen Elizabeth became a godly act, assuring the assassin of paradise in the world to come. We find on page 51, and I continue to read from Mr. Shepard's book, The Babington Plot. Had the power of the Pope been equal to his extravagant claims, Elizabeth would have been driven from her throne to obscurity or to an untimely and cruel death. The brightest chapter in British history would have been torn out. The England of the 16th century might have become as Spain, a country splendid in memories of the past, but clothed in rags, steeped in ignorance, and covered with superstitious clouds. While North America, the glorious daughter of Britain, instead of a miracle of light and progress, would have a history like Mexico, 
a country of beggars, bandits, and priests with the richest resources and the most restless, restless population that ever wasted the bounties of a generous climate and soil. But fortunately for the nations, happy for the liberties of the world, the Virgin Queen, notwithstanding her undoubted defects, had a hold on the English heart which Pope Pius and all his allies could not shake. And her triumph over her enemies not only made her strong, but overwhelmed them with confusion and disgrace. Now we find in this book by Shepherd at least a dozen different names of Jesuit assassins who wanted to destroy and kill Queen Elizabeth because she refused the idea of divine right and of submission to Rome. One man's name was Roberto Ridolfi. Another, William Allen. Francis Throgmorton. Robert Parsons. Edmund Campion. Captain Forte. John Ballard. Nicholas Saunders. John Savage. Anthony Terrell. William Perry. John Hart, Thomas Barnwell, Thomas Morgan, and finally, Anthony Babington. Because Queen Elizabeth had such protection from the throne of God, she was, her life was preserved. And finally, in 1588, the Spanish Armada sailed up the northern coast of, Eng of Europe to attack the little island nation of England. Through the intervention of God and the direction of Sir Francis Drake, the mighty Armada became as kindling in the shores of the English Channel and the Atlantic Ocean. Divine right, something the papacy will kill if a leader does not acknowledge it. John F. Kennedy did not acknowledge, once in office, the authority of Rome. And as a result, he was assassinated November 22nd, 1963. As I look back over the 20th century presidents of the United States, from Teddy Roosevelt to George Bush, only one of those presidents in all that time refused to submit to Roman control, and that was John F. Kennedy. Every other president, if you study their policies, if you study their movements in Europe and other parts of the world, they used the United States' military power and wealth to destroy one nation after another that refused to accept the authority of the papacy. And the United States throughout the 20th century has been used by the Catholic Church to pay back other countries who have hurt the Catholic Church and the Jesuit order in centuries past. We find in the 19th century this idea played out so clearly we have noticed in other tapes that through the Monroe Doctrine, James Monroe warned the papacy of trying to take over the United States. And American presidents in the 19th century 
refused to submit to the authority of the papacy, and many of them paid dearly for it. Andrew Jackson, William Henry Harrison, Zachary Taylor, Franklin Pierce, James Buchanan, and finally Abraham Lincoln, James Garfield, and then in 1901, William McKinley. To show you the importance, again, of the idea of divine right, we read from Burke McCarty's book called The Suppressed Truth about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. On page 44, she is talking here about William Henry Harrison, who was elected President of the United States in 1841. In his inaugural address, which was a masterpiece, President Harrison clearly, definitely, and finally cut any ground for hope from under the Jesuits when he said, We admit of no government by divine right, believing that so far as power is concerned, the beneficent creator has made no distinction among men, that all are upon an equality, and that the only legitimate right to govern is upon the express grant of power from the governed. The point of William Henry Harrison's inaugural address was that he believed in a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Thirty-five days later, William Henry Harrison was poisoned to death. He refused to submit his presidency into the hands of the reigning pope at that time, and 35 days later he was dead. We have seen this throughout history. First the English barons opposed it. Elizabeth the first. And now before we close, I want to take a look at one other man who sought to rule free from Roman power. His name was Otto von Bismarck. His country was Germany. The time was the 19th century. You see, Otto von Bismarck was known as the Iron Chancellor of Germany in the six, 1860s to the 1880s. He had been a very strong military leader, defeating Austria, which had been a Catholic Jesuit stronghold in Europe for centuries. And he defeated them at the Battle of Sadawa in 1866. This was an awful blow to the papacy. And in Edmund Perry's book called The Secret History of the Society of Jesus, on page 80, we find that after the battle at Sadawa, the Jesuit order tried to assassinate Otto von Bismarck. Then in 1870, the, Pope, the papacy declared themselves to be infallible. And in 1872, Otto von Bismarck recognized that if the Catholic Church claimed to be infallible, Germany and their security would be threatened because people would then be forced to obey the Pope above any leader in Germany. Bismarck believed that one-third of the people in Germany who were Roman Catholics were now directly under the control of the Pope. As a result, Otto von Bismarck outlawed the Jesuit order with the Coulter Kampf Law, and that brought him into contempt with the Pope. The Coulter Camp Law simply declared 
that the people of Germany, which had a constitution which guaranteed civil and political rights irrespective of religious belief, through this Coulter Camp law, Bismarck forbade the Catholic Church to intervene in the affairs of state, forbade the priests to discuss politics from the pulpit, and excluded the church from the state education system. This got Rome and the Jesuit order up in arms because von Bismarck dared, dared to reject the authority of the papacy, a foreign monarch in his country of Germany. Shortly after that, in 1874, there was another attempt on Otto von Bismarck's life. And finally, tragically, we read from the book Elizabeth the Last on page 204 that after the second attempt on von Bismarck's life, in 1880, he submitted to the Pope and he put an end to the Coulter camp that restricted Catholics from interfering with matters of state. From this time on, Otto von Bismarck was a pawn in the Pope's hands. Whatever the Pope requested of him, he did. Because of the two assassination attempts on his life, he was now but butter in the Pope's hand. And it was because of Germany's starting to surrender and submit to the divine right of the papacy to control their country, it was this that weakened the German nation and made them ripe for the destruction that came down upon them in World War I. The divine right. Otto von Bismarck went back to Canossa just as Henry IV had way back in the 11th century. All the kings of the world, the Bible says, have wandered after the beast. The deadly wound is healed. It's in the process of being healed. And all the world will wander after the beast. I see even in the terrorist and the battles that are raging right now, once again, the Taliban as extremist Muslims rejected the divine right of the Pope to interfere in their affairs. And so now the papacy is using the United States to annihilate them. So will the Pope use the United States again if any other Middle Eastern country refuses to submit to the divine right of the Pope. May God help each one of us to forever refuse to submit to the divine right that is not a divine right at all, but a usurpation of the devil to try to gain control of the world. May God bless and help each one of us to only submit to the divine right of the Lord Jesus Christ, who alone has the right 